On this episode of Penny's Going In Raw, the exclusive PJ Matlock interview, how he became a successful trader, met Zach Morris in the gang, and eventually founded Atlas. And then we're hitting on some PR keywords. Hey, yo, check one, two. This is Flavor Flav in the building for the Atlas crew. Atlas trading, what the fuck is up? They're traders, they're prodigies, and then there's legends. Rob, 4%, baby. No way. 4 fucking percent. Buy the fucking dip. Hey, who told me about IDEX? Like, dude, what the fuck? Like, someone just made, like, a m lot more money than me on my trade. You find out, likes this game of pennies. Did you check the portfolio? Pennies. 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 The margin for error is so small. I bet Warren Buffett never did that. And they out there making money right now off of penny stocks. The two guys is putting their work to make y'all rich. The pennies we need are everywhere around us. Time to think big! Pennies going in raw. Featuring Dan, Deity at Dips, and Hugh Honey. Produced by Vinny Strokes, baby. Welcome back to the Penny Stock Podcast presented by The Blazing Chronicle. Today is Sunday, October the 15th. And before we get into the PJ interview, a lot happened in the market this week we kind of need to talk about. From the debate to stimulus talks to everything in between, no true like big moves in the market, but it certainly didn't seem like pennies were back unless we're talking about Chinese pennies. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, we had a little bit, I think it was um, a little bit of solars moved, like that sector, but um, for the most part, it was Chinese stocks, which which moved, and I hate playing Chinese stocks. Weekly plug, China Hustle, go watch it. It's fantastic. It's all about Chinese stocks and how fraudulent they are. I even realized like how th there were companies coming out, Chinese companies saying like, we don't know why our stock's up 600% <laughs> or 1,000%. I think it was WEI. Do you like, why were these Chinese stocks running all this week? You know, I mean, sometimes it's all it takes is one stock to have somewhat decent news. And I mean, some of these floats are a million, two million shares. So when they're, when they're like $2, I mean, anybody could basically buy the float on these. So, I mean, all it takes is one to go like, you know, a few hundred percent to ignite the entire sector. And then you have, then you find one with like a float of like 500K and like Weemi or something. And it just flies. And like the company is like, the company halts the stock and then it comes out, you know, after hours saying like, oh, we have no idea why our stock's up so much. But they halt it. So it completely ruins momentum. You know, I mean, it, it's a whole shit show. But could you imagine what that CEO was feeling like when he saw his uh, account up 10x for his uh, for his uh, contribution? 10x. I mean, his stock was up a thousand percent. I bet he was feeling great that uh, he had to halt it, sell it, and then uh, we'll we'll start again tomorrow. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, man, uh, the, those Chinese stocks in general have just been moving. We saw several of them go 100 fold, like just ton, tons and tons. But other than that, obviously, this is the last episode of SPACtober where we discuss SPAC every week of the month. And uh, is it? And this is, you know, we do have the merger on the 28th, I believe. <clears throat> so is it fair to say that SPACtober didn't turn out the way that we had hoped? Yeah, I mean, but I think that that's, you know, the sentiment. When you have so many people on one side, and we talked about this, when you have so many people on one side, it's never... It, I mean, it never usually works out exactly how you want it when all of Fintwit is on is on the same side of something. Yeah, I mean, it, it was one of those things, and and you know, you saw it's run up, and just given the market sentiment and everything, those with uh, diamond hands, they 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 got it rough, man. And uh, I think it really plays into the fact of that. I think this merger might have like happened at like the worst time it ever could have happened. Yeah. Uh, with the election happening and then the Nicola guy disappearing into thin air and and just uh, the the what was it battery day not going great for EV stocks it it was just a, a mixture of everything and in, in the market sentiment itself and uh, I think everyone probably learned a lesson from it too about how much they uh, want to put their account into a <laughs> stock you know stuff like that uh it takes a lesson to learn, and 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 I think it might have helped people out in the yeah, end. Yeah, no, definitely. And and the good thing is that this lesson was learned for almost minimal. I mean, you know, even if you sold at like the lowest point, like it really wasn't. It wouldn't have been that bad of a loss. Um, but I think. Yeah, if you bought at fifteen and sold at eleven, you're you're what like 
25, 30%. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot better than, um, you know, I mean, I mean, a tough lesson. I was just listening to, if you guys listened to Trader for a Cause, I was listening to uh, Nathan, and he took a 250K bath on something. Now, granted, you know, if 250K isn't a lot to, to, you know, some people, but um, it's all perspective. And for him, that was like a, it was almost like when I blew up my 7K when I was like, you know, when I was younger. So, you know, I mean, if you took a bath on this, like 20%, you you should 100% use this as a learning lesson. I still think that SPAC could go, okay? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the stock's not over, and the merger's still this yeah. week. I mean, the, it could always turn around. Yeah, honestly, like, I wouldn't mind if, if we just rinsed everybody out, and then the merger was, was approved, and it went. But again, I mean, this, this was a clear sign that this was a clear, great indicator that the stock didn't do anything wrong. Um, no, There was no delay on the merger, no delay on the votes, anything like that. But because of the outside outliers, um, the stock didn't move the way that we wanted to. And I think that this is a really good learning point for all around, um, for position sizing, how, how the stock can be perfect. And um, just because you know, some other SPACs moved really well that it only takes a few outside outliers to fuck everything up. Yep. And uh, it also has to do with like your risk management and everything else. So did you have had a stop loss or were you just adding on dips and it kept dipping? I mean, I'll be honest, if I see a $7 FSR share, man, I'm going to start loading the boat. I mean, then then you look at the risk management there and I'll think about it compared to here and, and I'll definitely uh, I'll definitely add more into like my Roth and whatnot. Yeah. Okay, I think that kind of sums it up for this week in the market. And for the moment you've all been waiting for, the PJ PGIR interview where we find out more about how Atlas was formed, how PJ became the trader he is today, and how this PJ Zach Morris Hugh Henney love connection all started. <laughs> Let's hear it. And we are joined today with PJ Matlock, owner and handsome executive of <laughs> Atlas Trading. How are you, man? What's up, brother? How are you? Dude, doing great. So, like, like we're just trading every day, but I think, you know, th this is all about you, man. This is your day. <laughs> I think if you could kind of give us a timeline of your trading history, how you started, when you knew it was going to work, and how Atlas came to be, like, that'd be awesome. If you could just kind of get us off rip with that. Yeah, yeah. So, like, I kind of, I kind of went the path. I feel like a most, a lot of people do, where they're they start out and they get lucky a couple of times, and then everything just quits working, and then you start, you know, the losing streak. And uh, I remember the day that I learned what a simple moving average was is the day I started losing money. And uh, it just kept going down from there. And I, you know, I joined a chat room and paid to be there. Yeah, that's where I, that, that first room I joined is where I met everybody pretty much like Mullins Momentum, Zach Morris, like um, uh, Cam the Man even. You know, I met all these guys in that first chat room. And um, yeah, I, I didn't know what the hell was going on or anything. So I ended up getting extremely frustrated with it and I left the room and kind of went on my own for a while. And I ended up losing, uh, for me, which was a lot of money at the time, uh, about 20, 20 to 22,000 in the first eight months, you know? And, um, that's yeah, still a lot of, pe that's still a lot of money for most people, man. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. It, I started, <laughs> so I started out with like 500 bucks, you know, and then I lost most of that. And then uh, I, I brought money over from crypto. I, I was doing cryptocurrency, like mining and stuff like that, like before the the pop, you know, and I uh, made some money there. Yeah, so basically you're you're buying weed off of Silk Road. Pretty much. Yeah, I, a little bit, <laughs> a, a little bit. Yeah, I was doing doing all kinds of things with with crypto. And I so I would do things on like a little bit dark web stuff. But uh, I mostly would just buy the shit and hold it and, you know, it would go, Bitcoin would go up and I'd sell it and it'd go back down and I'd buy more, you know. What was your strategy at that time? That was it. I would, I would just like look and I felt like I knew when it was cheap because I was watching it every day. And I was yeah. living in a, uh, an apartment at the time um, 
and I feel I feel like that's kind of like foreshadowing and to your to your trading method now of just scalping and uh, just being such a quick trader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just like kind of find it's it it's like finding good deals pretty much, you know. And uh, so I I made some money off of that. I made like you know a little bit of money, and I I brought all of it over into trading because a buddy of mine I met at the gym was talking to me one day about trading and uh, trading stocks. And I, I was like, Oh, that's, that's something rich people do. You know, I can't do that. And he was like, no, man, look, I've only got 5,000 bucks or whatever it was. And he's like, you know, I made 10 grand today. And I was like, what? So I went home that night and never looked back. I just dove into stocks. I just kept adding money. So like when I first joined, when I first, like my first you know, open Robin Hood, same thing everyone does. Uh, got on stock twits, started following people. I thought it was either I hit one. I think it was. Um, uh, it'll it'll come to me, but I hit one and it it ran like three hundred percent. And I was just out and about for the day, and I was like, oh my god, this is the easiest money I've ever made in my life. I'm, I'm done. Like this is game over for me. I'm trading for the rest <laughs> of my life. You know. And uh, then, <laughs> you know, a couple of days later, I was I was reading more into learning how to trade. And someone said, you know, oh, you've got to know what this simple moving average is. And I looked it up and I was like, oh, OK, shit. OK, so the 200, the 20, the 50, the 10. And then someone was using like the nine EMA, I think. And I was like, OK, I'll use those. Oh, man. From there, I just kept losing money and I kept adding money and uh losing more and event it, it total was about 20,000 in money and i was heavy in debt i owed you know every i owed my mom money um bills were tight cuz you know i've got a daughter a wife house car notes and uh my wife doesn't make very much money so it was kind of more on me and uh my job at the time i was not making that much so yeah, it was just, you know, and then then I had everybody around me telling me to quit. Like, oh, you're you're gambling, you don't know what you're doing. My buddy, uh, how how many years into this or how many months into this were were you from from your point at the gym when your buddy's like this is it to the point where you're like all your family members are telling you maybe this isn't it. Uh probably month like 8 to 10. <laughs> Yeah. When, when I just kept, when everything was just kept going down, you know, and I, I was throwing money into like, you know, I paid, paid a guy to talk to him for, you know, a little while. And that cost me a bunch of money and paid for all these indicators. I thought I had like, no joke. I bought indicators that you can have for free, like all the EMAs and SMA setups on thinkorswim. I thought this you know, I thought I had to buy them. So I bought them <laughs> and, uh, was in this chat room, had to pay, like, I forgot what it was. I think it was like a thousand a year, 1200 a year. And, uh, or I think it was more. And if you pay for a year up front, it was, you know, cheaper. And I was like, I've got to have this to be successful. And it's just like, I just kept throwing money into all these trading courses and yeah. And they, there really is like no easy way around it. <laughs> no, not at all. It's all, you know, ex- is, is that kind of, is, is that kind of like why you uh, ended up yep. starting Atlas? Well, yep. I mean, because I mean you, me and me and Hugh, whenever we were like, okay, there's so many people just screwing people over giving away this education. And we're like, he has it for free. And we talk about this on a daily basis. Let's just do it. And just record it and put it out. And now it kind of seems like that's what you did with Atlas and making exactly like, how, how exactly did that like come apart from all of this? So I was I, like I said, I was very frustrated with everybody in the first room that I was in. I felt like they took advantage of me. And honestly, it wasn't their fault. I'm the one that paid the money, you know, like I was the kind of the, the sucker in the situation. They were just offering. Yeah. They offered and I just kept, you know, I thought I had to have it. So. Uh, I kept going and that's kind of what led me into being like, you know, forget this paid chat room stuff. And I I honestly don't have anything against paid rooms. You know, I know some guys that own them and and they're doing well and the rooms are doing well, but you know, they've got more of like an intimate setting and, you know, it works for them. But I, I was just frustrated because there wasn't anything out there that 
you know, everybody could go to like a true forum of people that wasn't stock twits, that wasn't all these pumpy guys, you know, and just everything's going to the moon and every, you know, hate left and right and uh, crazy profit targets and all this crap. So I, I just really was like, why doesn't this exist? And that kind of led into to Atlas. I, I always had the dream of starting my own room. But um, so so back to what happened about eight to 10 months, lost a bunch of money. And then uh, a lot of you guys may not know this. I haven't talked about it in a while, but uh, the person that initially helped me uh, turn things around was Trade Smart Stocks Uchia. So, yep. So I went to his room. Is that, is that like a uh, is that like a car dealership or something? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it, but no. So so what what I did was I started. You know, I was watching at the time Cam Cam the man. I was watching all his stuff, and I was watching other guys on on stock twits and Twitter, and I would notice that this guy would post would post stuff first and everybody else would post after him. And it just seemed to happen every time. I was like, wow, he's finding things before anyone, you know? So I was like, fuck all this. I want to go to the source. So I went to him, I messaged him and I was like, Hey man, you know, pretty much, I don't know if you offer it, but you have one-on-ones or anything. He's like, yep, I got a, he's got a paid room. He's got one-on-one sessions, which, you know, I, I dove in and I was like, let's do it. But, um, he was way cheaper. It was like more reasonable at the time. I think it was like, uh, he, he didn't have many members. It was like 70 bucks a month. And that was, uh, with a one hour session a week of a one-on-one, you know, and man, he, at the time, you know, like I said, he didn't have a lot of members. So when we would get on voice, we would be on voice for hours and hours when I was only paying him for one hour, we'd sit there for, you know, like two or three hours talking. And, um, that's when I kind of, I got more into scalping then and, and was like watching the news plays and stuff. And then when I started getting kind of developed your strategy, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but I got too scalpy where it was like, you know, everything I'm trading is for two cents, you know, and it, you can't long term. That just doesn't work. Yeah, I've kind of noticed that like the difference, like scalping for those small gains in this market, maybe not a bad idea, but right. that will really limit you. And where that market was in like June. And right. May. Yeah. So, that yeah, there's t- there's different markets and you've got to you've got to learn to trade them differently. So the the market at the time was kind of shitty for me. You know, I, I when the market would get hot, I wouldn't do well and everybody else would. But when the market was shitty and nothing was running, that seemed to be the time that I was killing it, you know? And so everybody else would be losing and I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm up today. And that's because, you know, I'm looking for the two cent pop and I'm in and out and then, you know, nothing's holding anyway. So, but yeah, this should, it doesn't work long term. And you, and you've got to, you've got to adapt to each market, you know, and that, that took me the longest to figure out really is, is adapting to each market. So uh, after a while, I wanted to, I, I thought about starting my own room and I was like, I, you know, I knew I wasn't quite good enough to start my own room by myself. And I was like, do I do a paid room and get money from subscribers? Do I do a free room and just make it all education and, you know, have people in whatever anybody who wants to join can, you know? And um, a couple of days later, I, I went, I, I was on, it was, uh, I was on vacation and I was literally talking to my wife about it. It was like, I want to start my own room. And I mean, I know that like, I probably won't have any members, but I just want to start my own thing and do my own thing. I don't, I just don't want to. What year was this? Oh man. Uh, what year was that? I'm never good at this. Because I mean, today we're talking in October, 2020 and uh, it's Atlas is at 50,000 people. So I it's, know. it's crazy to think about <laughs> you talking to your girlfriend at the time or your your wife now whatever it may be right uh and saying i might not have anyone in this chat room right yeah no it's funny yeah so that was i think 2017 i think wow i think 2017 i could be i could be wrong 
It's either 2017 or 2018. I'm sorry, I can't. I can't remember. So, still, it's like a remarkable amount of growth for such yeah, a short period of time. Yeah. Well, I, I still didn't start the room yet, and, and I still knew the guys that were in the old chat room we were in, and uh, you know, would message them every now and then, like Zach and stuff. But Zach really. He, he wouldn't really talk to me very much. He was real quiet. And then one day I posted a picture of my car on uh, like Twitter or stock twits and it had a Texas license plate. And Zach messaged me. He's like, yo, man, where do you live in Texas? And I was like, I, you know, I live in Houston. And he was like, oh, man, I live in Houston. And he turned out he lived like an hour away from me. But then a few months later, well, a little while later, he ended up moving up, like moving closer to me. So he's like. 20 minutes from me now but yeah it's crazy i feel like so many people thought it was like you and zach were just the best of buds and we're like hey let's make atlas and yeah was no so there just so forever but it, well then we started trading talking friendship more. Right. born in trading and dying in trading yeah exactly so we we started being friends and getting close and then uh it was funny when I told my wife that I wanted to start the room, we went on our like honeymoon. We didn't take because of I had a hospital situation. So we went on this honeymoon and I was telling her all about it there. And Cam, the man messaged me and said, Hey, uh, you know, I want to start. Oh, he, uh, he turned $1,000 into $1 million in just 190. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he messaged me and said, you know, I want to start a chat room and I want you to be a part of it. And I was like, oh, man. He's like, yeah, we'll make you, you know, part like you're owner of it. We're going to do, you know, all this stuff. And I thought about it and I, I was like, man, this could be really good for me, you know, exposure wise, because nobody even knows who I am at this point. You know, it's like I had like 500 followers on stock twits. Well, uh, so I ended up saying yes to it. And I get in the room and I see all the guys in there, you know, Mullins Momentum, Zach Morris. And Zach was like, yeah, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. And I was like, sweet. Hell yeah. Okay. And man, I don't know what happened, but I was just on fire in that room. Like we had a thing every single day where we would see who called the top gainer of the day. And like 99% of the time it was me like every day. And uh, so I was just like murdering it. You started to get your groove on. Yeah, yeah. I was like, I was murdering yeah. it. Subdol fuck Zach Morris. <laughs> so just so everyone knows, subdoly fuck Zach Morris. Sub- su- subtly? Fuck. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Yeah, I, li- I like how I like how Hugh pronounces subtly exactly like it's called subtly. Subtly. Fuck you guys. <laughs> you got him, dude. <laughs> so, so Al- Atlas has begun. The empire has started. You guys are at five hundred. Does it is it just steady growth for the next two years? Like how how does it turn into what it is? So, now? yeah. So so you know we were in Cam's room and and then I kind of broke off and I quietly left. I didn't. You know, I didn't tell anybody I was leaving. Oh, just, this is still Cam's room. Yeah, so it was I, Cam's I got room. Confused. So this yeah. is a totally separate. Okay, totally so separate. Holy I, shit! I just, um, you know, it was nothing against Cam really. It was just I didn't like some of the way things were going, and I just, I just really wanted to do my own thing. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna. I was, I felt like I was overworking myself in his room, stressed out, you know. And I was like, I, I can't do it anymore. So sent him a nice message and said, you know, no hard feelings. So I'm going to go do my own thing. And I started Atlas. Well, well, the boys just followed. Well, it wasn't even Atlas. It was just a blank room that I had bots in, you know, these bots that I made, you know, and uh, I was just tweaking. It it was was PJ in a news bot. (laughs) PJ in a news bot, pretty much. And, uh, and then Zach messaged me. He's like, where'd you go? And I was like, you know, I think I'm going to do my own thing. And then, you know, that's when like everybody came ultra chart wars, Zach, pretty much all like most of the admins over there came into Atlas. Well, I didn't do that on purpose, but, you know, they were in Cam's room and then they came into mine and it kind of upset him for a little bit. And uh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. But uh, but that's, you know, what ended up happening. And they yeah, everybody was, you know, Atlas is more free. You can cuss. You can, you know you know, ass bot. Ass bot. All that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just more of a chill environment where you can kind of be yourself as long as you're not, you know, saying some 
not really to, yeah, yeah. piss anyone off i mean yeah, yeah i mean, I mean just no, not you can piss lines. people off for sure yeah <laughs> yeah there's like there's a you know there the rules are are lax lax you know so yeah i mean it's it's crazy to think about like just just six months ago is it like twenty thousand people and it's just doubled i mean so many people coming into the market it's so hot like my brother-in-law i have i have this has happened to me probably seven or eight times now where like my brother-in-laws will call me and like, hey, man, I was talking to a guy in California and he was telling me about a room he was in for trading and it's your room. And I was like, ah, that's my brother-in-law. And it's like, I get that story so many times. And it's like, I feel like we. Yeah, dude, when it, whenever you told us about people coming up to you in real life or like, have you heard the podcast page going to Rob? I was like, yeah, yeah dude, I was, I was at a baby shower, <laughs> like not a baby shower, a gender, a gender reveal party. And this guy comes up and he's like, yeah, man, I was like oh my god that's so sweet like we're like kind of low-key uh famous i guess you know but dude i told you in the atlanta airport a dude came up to me he had face tat he he was he was a he was a man he like he would have kicked my ass <laughs> and he was like bro i was thinking about quitting trading but now i'm seeing you here and it's like a sign i'm like okay yeah for sure but you see like <laughs> you see so dan you you kind of started more recently right you started early to january right like uh it was like november i started like right before okay. the crash uh and everything yeah so but like i i saw the slow market i saw the down right the, the halt downs every day and then i saw the up and i'm seeing it you know right. i've got i've gotten quite a range this past year i feel like you have um uh, adapted very quickly and most people don't don't do that like your story is pretty unique too and uh but I, but I also I wanted to ask you, do you think that like Atlas and this kind of environment, do you think it helped you grow? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Whenever I see like myself as like one of these traders, it's like at first you would join some rooms and they're calling so many stocks and they're all going up. And then you start to realize as time goes on, you could call any stock in June and it went up and. I feel like Atlas, especially when you look at the trading floor, it's more people like not no, not everyone's on the same stock. Everyone's on their same page, right? And then they do their own thing, and then they get confirmation from other people. And I think that's where the beauty of it comes from. It's like a collective group of ideas. Hell yeah! And then yeah, yeah, man. Oh, um, so I was gonna kind of go on with the story. Um, yeah, we we just started blowing up like crazy, but um, but my trading trading wise, you know, I got down to like you know around eight hundred dollars total to my name, and um, that you know things got Damn. yeah yeah it, it got pretty scary for a while, and I took that eighty eight hundred dollars and I brought it to ninety thousand, and um, well, I got up to like. The, the issue is, you know, I was still having to pay bills and it wasn't like I could just grow my account. Yeah, yeah. One one of the questions I guess, I guess we can kind of go into now while you're at this is how do you manage paying yourself? Is there a way to continue living expenses right. while growing and an account? That was one I was going to ask later, which I kind of... Yeah, and it, it really depends on... It, it's all situational because... How, you know what how much yeah. bill what are your bills you had a daughter, yeah you had all this stuff. yeah and at the time my bills were high income was low and uh so it's it's really it was really hard to pay myself because every time i would then i would be back at square one you know i'd had this three thousand dollar account i'd get it to four and have to withdraw a thousand and i'm back at three then get it to four i have to withdraw I'm back at three so it felt like running in place for a long time and i feel like when you start trading every single card is stacked against you because one, you don't want to start with a bunch of money because you're going to lose it. Two, you've got PDT going against you. And three, you don't have the experience. You don't know how to make money in the market. So like trying to make money is a bad idea because the sharks are going to take it from you, you know? So you really, trading is such an emotional roller coaster and mental, you've got to have some real mental fortitude to to push past it. And I, man, I've almost broken a few times, you know, where I would get my account up and then take a big loss and think, you know, I'm, I'm done with this. Um, then, uh, I would, when I still had the $3,000 account, I still had another job and I was working, but I had a, a hospital situation come up. I was in the hospital for a couple months 
And when I got out, I was home for a couple months and I couldn't do anything. I was stuck in a chair. So, you know, what better time than to focus on trading? So I just sat there on my laptop learning and researching everything and trying to make money and losing money chasing. How long ago was this? That was what date was Hurricane Harvey. So that was what, two years ago? 2017, yeah. Two and a half. August of 2017. So you've really been just super focused for the last three years. Like, yeah. You, like, oh, yeah. You know, I think a, like eat, sleep, breathe. Yeah. It. I think a lot of, I think a big misconception is that, you know, you've been doing, which you have to some extent been doing this for, for, for a good chunk of your uh, life. But um, how long have you really focused? Yeah. It's not that, it's not like 10, yeah. It's not like 10 years, you know, but I know guys that have, you gotta think Hugh is only 21 and he's traded longer than you have. So it's really not that long. Right. You know? Well, right. But it's like, it's, it doesn't, it kind of doesn't matter. Uh, because yeah. I know guys that are trading for 10 years and they're still not making as much money. And I know guys that are trading for one year and they're fucking killing it. It, it, it's about drive and how fast you can learn the shit and how fast you can learn from your mistakes. And, you know, obviously, if you devote 100 percent of yourself to it, you're going to learn faster than somebody putting in 10 percent, you know. So, yeah, I, I think another thing is, is like like how you just said you started you were like pedal to the metal. Let's grind. Let's learn more stuff. But at the same time, you said you started losing money whenever you first learned your basic first thing about stocks. Where was that point where you were like, OK, just learning one thing about stock, like an SMA, isn't enough. I, and then where you were like, okay, I really got this down. Right. So it never, man, it, it almost never seems like enough. Every time you learn something, it seems like it yep. opens a door to 15 other doors. <laughs> and you open another door mm -hmm. and there's 15 more doors. So it's so it's so hard to because, you know, people come to me and they'll say, you know, teach me trading. And, mm -hmm. oh, how do you know how to find this? And it's so experience based. It's like, and it's also like trying to tell someone how to ride a bicycle over the phone. You know, it's so hard to do. You can't like, you can't do it. i have like, unless I'm sitting there with you, it's very hard to say, this is what I'm looking for. And, and do you see it? Because I mean, I, I remember like, I don't post about this a lot, but I, I'm very technical. Like I get, I'm kind of a, Uchia actually made me this way. Um, with, with trend lines and, and patterns where I'll see people call an ascending triangle and it's not an ascending triangle or, you know, a, a bull flag, bear flag, whatever, whatever. And they're wrong. Totally. Their lines are not right. And that used to really get to me. I don't really care anymore, but it used to annoy me when I'd see people post like, Oh, this is a, an ascending triangle about to break. And I'm like, no, that's not, <laughs> But um, yeah, the, the beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Yeah, exactly. And it, and also it it kind of takes a long time and looking at charts for thousands of hours to really see it and say, OK, no, that's for sure. You know, a wedge or a bull flag or it whatever. It really is like the 10,000 hour rule, even in trading. Yeah, it's so true. So true. And, you know, I've got some family, they want to get into it, but they're not as serious. And they, it, there's no easy way. Like literally, I'm not even kidding when I say this, I've done a lot of different things in my life. I won't go into here, but a lot of different things. And this is by far the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And the most frustrating. Well, you seem pretty fucking good at yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's uh, also the most rewarding when you figure it out, you know, when you get into yeah. a good groove. But like I said, get, losing everything to $800, my, my, at the time, my house note alone was $1,700 a month. And only having 800 bucks yeah. to my name and no money coming in is pretty scary, you know? So... Uh, yeah. yeah. And I, and then after the hospital stuff, I really had to start grinding there and, you know, it was, it was very frustrating. But so once I got my, um, account up, you know, I got over PDT eventually went back below PDT, went back above PDT. I, I really struggled with, uh, consistency. You know, I'd hit a, w a big winner and then lose, 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 and hit a big winner and lose, 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 lose. That's called the sunny effect when you the sunshine. Over PDT over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what's going on with them right now. And I, I honestly, like, I think, I think it's part of it. And, um, you know, even so when I took that 80, 800 bucks and I went to 90 K, I thought 
you know, that's, that's where most people figure they figured it out and they're good to go from there. 10,000% gains is damn good. amount. Insane. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I know. But did not happen to me. So I got my 90 K I got cocky. I got stupid. I started, but I got with, um, trade zero at the time had seven times leverage on their account on, on, on accounts. Yeah. Yeah. So I got with them and I used it and man, I hit a losing streak. My main, my main loss, my biggest loss, uh, it, it's not even, you know, it's collectively is all on Roku. I just, man, I think uh, Hugh was around, Hugh was around during these days. <laughs> this was only a couple of years ago. Like I, I kept trying to trade this damn thing. And I, I, I'm not kidding. 10 out of 10 trades I would lose on. This thing whipsawed me. I'd short it. Do you have anything to say to those people that, that may be on like a losing streak that you kind of, that you kind of saw yourself on that you may have wanted to do done differently? Oh my God. You have to stop. <laughs> like take a break. If you, if there is a, a specific ticker you're trying to trade, cause I got into where I was like, oh, I just need to find one or two stocks like, you know, the Tesla or the, the Roku or the Apple or whatever, and just trade those every day. Well, if you fall in love with it and that's the one you want to trade, that's fine. But if you are not, if it, if you're not learning on it and you're not worried, don't keep adding money to it. Don't keep trying to, to get bigger on it and try to make the money back. Cause what happened with me is I, I started digging a hole. I remember my first loss was $5,000. And from that day, I'm not kidding. I lost five thousand plus dollars a day f- until my account was in just a couple of weeks. My account was at ten thousand dollars, and Jesus. from ninety, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I like I'll, I'll be honest with you guys. I've struggled here and there with depression in the past. That one got me. I, 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 I you, you want to talk about wanting to quit? I had Atlas at this time. Atlas was up and running. I wanted to delete Atlas. Yeah, yeah, I was I was going to I was going to say that bad that bad stretch. That one's it yep, right there. Yep. And well, and on top of it, I you know, at the time Atlas was causing me so much stress because I felt I kind of felt taken advantage of. I was the only one up. I mean, Hugh knows I was up 3 a.m. programming bots for the room. Yeah. I was always always awake. I never slept. My wife hated it. My yeah, I would shoot you a DM. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's I like think, I think the thing is, chill. like, whenever you realize as a CEO of something, no one cares if anything goes no wrong. No one gives it's a your fuck. Fault. Yep. I think that's a yep. Yep, and fit. You know, this bot's broken. This bot. Oh shit! Now this website changed this. I got to change the bot again. And it was like I've kind of put all that on the back burner, and I just kind of fix it when I can because. Man, I I wasn't setting hours for myself. I would be here all day, every day to where even my wife was like, I don't even know. Like, I don't spend time with her anymore. I don't. I wasn't Are you married my, to me or Atlas? Exactly. I wasn't giving anything attention. But the, the thing is, and nobody understands this and nobody will when you're struggling and you're trying to go. Every person told me to quit including my wife. We even talked like, oh, do you want to start door dashing? Do you want to get like Uber, you know, cause I'm just, we're struggling. And I was like, look, man, I know that it is possible to make money doing this. I see people doing it and I know that it's, it's possible. I can't stop until I get there because if I know that it can be done and other people are doing it, I know that I can figure out how to do it no matter what. So you really have to have that mentality and trading and, and learning because you're going to go through fucking frustrating hard times. And honestly, it's, it's a lot of like, it, it's a job where people make millions of dollars. It's not easy. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, it, and everybody thinks it's easy because you just buy something when it's low and sell it when it goes up. Right. Or you just follow some guy on Twitter and, and, you know, and, and chase his calls, you know, yeah, right. You, you keep, like, you keep going, you keep following that guy on Twitter. See how it works. Yeah. It's not going to work out long term. <laughs> yeah. You've got to figure out your own plan and strategy. So when I, when I got down to the 10, I, you know, whole new level of depression. I was spending all this money a month on Atlas with the, with the subscription fees and all everything like, you know, and then someone mentioned, Hey, why don't you add a a donation link? 
And I was like, oh, I don't, I don't want that. Like I did not want a paid room. So I don't want to like ask for donations. It's just like, this is going against everything I wanted. I learned from everyone in there. It's not, it's not like I'm in here just giving all the information. I'm learning from every, from Hugh, from Zach, from Ripster, from, from paint, from rocket Bob, from everybody in here, like incredible Bob, come on. Like, the, man, this guy's so helped me so much. Even new traders come up, come up with new ways. Yeah. But before it, we get into kind of the, uh, the, like there, before we run out of time, we, we do have like five questions, but I think you had one for you where he was trying to get into. What was that, Hugh? No. So I was going to say was that, you know, I think it's really interesting because that, you know, that really wasn't that long ago that you were, um, no, it you wasn't were struggling where Atlas, at, where Atlas was bringing you down and yet you still didn't charge. I mean, if you just charged one person, I mean, everybody a dollar a month at that time, I mean, that would be some people's salaries, right? Exactly. Yep. And I, um, and, and I got, so I, I got close to that. I really did. I, I got really close to charging. I got really close to leaving. Yeah. I like no joke. It was it was a it was a Friday night. Me and my buddy sat down and I wrote out a message to post an atlas. And Monday I was going to post. Wow. I posted the donation, the donation link, you know, and I, I just left it there. I didn't tag everybody or make it a thing. I just kind of put it up there. And uh, so what was it? it was either Saturday or Sunday. Fucking Hugh Henny. <laughs> decided to send me $500 out of the blue. <laughs> and I'm not even kidding. I cried. <laughs> like, I'm not kidding. Like, I was like, Oh my fucking God, this guy just <laughs> sent me $500 just to say thank you. Like, just to say thank you. And that really like you, whether you know it or not, that fucking saved Atlas. Like doing, doing that changed my mindset. And I was already in this negative mindset. Nobody's helping me. I'm down. My account's down. I'm trying to get back above PDT. I'm trading on a stock trade that sucks. I can't buy the penny stocks. And there's, you know, all the crap going on. And it seemed Click like... Clickbait. How Hugh Henney saved Atlas. <laughs> yeah. No. No, you, no, like, no. Dude. And I thought I added two extra zeros by the, by mistake because you sent me the nicest message <laughs> in the world. And I was like, I, I, dude, I ran. I fucking ran to my computer because I was like, holy shit. I was dude, like, I, I love PJ. Number. But... <laughs> <laughs> bro yeah. i mean like that's the crazy thing is you kind of zoomed out realized what you had and i even i have mentioned it to you whenever it was like forty five thousand people i was like dude you don't have a chat room you have a, a fucking brand yeah it like is. almost yeah. at this point and then i was like dude we should do something with this and you're like eh, no let's just keep making people money and i was like <laughs> okay well that's fine with me and, it, and it's like one of those things where it's like they're not trying to take advantage of you. They're making enough money as is. It doesn't right. fucking matter. Yeah, but. I know, I know. And and then I had Zach, who who really kind of saved me too, which was, uh, you know, when when you're struggling, all you want is for somebody to reach their hand down and grab you and say, "I've got you," and pull you up, right? Or at least say, "I'm struggling with you." Let let you not know right. you're alone. But but. I was alone. Everybody else was doing great. Zach was killing it. Hugh was killing it. Everybody was killing it. I was the one down, you know? And yeah, Zach told me, listen, he's like, listen to me, man. He, Cause he, me and Zach have a very similar story in terms of how trading pattern and lose losses and growing. And, and he told me whether you realize it or not, this is going to make you the best trader ever. Like it, you don't, you don't realize what this is doing for you. And, and later on, he told me like, there's so many times where he wanted to reach in and say, you know what, let me fucking trade for you. Let me give you a couple bucks and just like pay your bills for a few months just to get me like going. Honestly, if he would have done that, if he would have, if, if I would have, you know, some magical way he would have traded my account for me, I would have never have learned, you know, like you've got to, you've got to go through that kind of pain and get through it and come out better to appreciate it. You know, if, if you have someone saving you every time, then you, you're not going to make it, you know, like you have to kind of back against the wall. I didn't become profitable until, uh, until I got fired from my job. 
Like that was my thing. I was like, Fuck, yeah, well, yeah, you're kind of out. backs yeah. against the wall. You don't have another choice. Yeah, I, I have to make this work. Yeah. So we see it every morning. You play tons of news stocks with tons of volumes. How do you manage those PRs? Differentiate the good from the bad, and essentially manage to exit so profitable to a point where you've been green for what is it now? 180 days in a row or something crazy? I think it's like 140 something. I need to look. Yeah, they're all the it's same. Like, yeah, yeah it's like that, that's how you make a good bit of your money. It seems like before the market even opens, you've already <clears throat> grinded so much. You're up damn so, large amount. Honestly, like I've been sleeping in a little bit because, I mean, the actually the pre market's been pretty hot lately. Um, and this morning I was up early, but um, I you gotta you've got to realize when the market is hot pre market and when the market's hot after hours. You know, sometimes we wake up and the biggest gapper up gapper is like 30 percent for the day or 20 percent. And it's like, this sucks. You know, go back to bed. And uh, sometimes it's all after hours runners. So if I see a trend of like pre-market hitting a couple days in a row, then I'll be up early that next day to to watch for news because the same news that would work during a hot market won't work in a cold market. The other thing that's important to learn is you've got to know your tickers and know like which ones are low floats, which ones can run and read news quickly. <laughs> because if you read the news, if you're slow, you're, you're late to the party. But I will say that most of these runners that get good news, they always have a nasty dip. Like they pop. If you get in early, you're safe, you know, you're good. It pops and dips, but they usually have at least one pretty pretty wicked dip to where if you are a little late to the news you can wait for that dip and buy it you know and um you know that's another thing is is i'm i like finding things that are cheaper and beaten down more and uh dip buys i guess i i suck at breakout buying i might add to a position on a breakout but i don't like going in yeah that's on something a i always like to touch in with you on is because he he always manages to add on the breakouts and and more than often than not they uh they keep going as yeah as i'm like damn see every time i i add on a breakout not not if that is my starting position if i add it seems uh, you know it comes right back down and i end up losing but like people like ripster He'll, he'll like, hey, man, what do you think of this chart? And he'll post a chart. And it's, man, it's already up. <laughs> like, you know. It's up 20% higher. on the yeah, day. And no, I'm like, thanks. No, what I'm, you talking yeah, about? Yeah, I'm like, I, don't, I, can't, I can't fuck with that. I'm not buying that, you know. And uh, then, but it keeps going. And I'm like, okay, well, you know. So I'm just, I'm not that kind of trader yet. I might, I might get those skills. Yeah. Different, different strokes for different folks. Yeah. So now for now, I just like, I like the, you know, bottom curling charts, the beaten down ones that, you know, get awesome news, you know, something happened, you know, crazy. And, and they just take off like hurts the other day was insane, you know? And, um, yes, it's just one of those things. And then you get bullied about people. Those stocks are worthless now. Yeah. If you didn't sell it. Well, yeah. I mean, they all, dude, we're trading penny stocks. They're all garbage companies and they're going to come back down. You just trade the momentum and and be done with it. You know, it's like, yeah, Yeah. like what, like 1% of them make it in our actual companies, you know, but wait, while we're on the subject, I think a great, I, I literally can just think of this example from today. ACST is literally the fattest pig in the world. Let me see. Um, <laughs> a- ACST? Yeah, I see it. Yeah. Dude, the fattest pig inside the world. What it run like 400% or something inside the past 24 hours? Um, and then they dropped an offering today. If you guys think that that company didn't have that offering just sitting, sitting there, there ready waiting yeah saliva salivating Sal- sal- just yeah. waiting salivating yeah just waiting <laughs> yeah whatever the fuck it is what, what is it sal salivating <laughs> so, oh my god, god salivating <laughs> Wow. I don't think it's ACST because yeah. yeah. that one's only that one's about the same right now. Yeah. I don't know if it's ACST it, it, or ACS. What is it? ACTS? Whatever it is, uh, you. I, I don't know. You. Know, I'll. I'll I'll um. What do you call? I'll look it, at it today. Well, well like ASTC, I said, we are bro. like five A- days ASTC. in the past. ASTC. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. ASTC. Um, so, what do you call? It? I went like four hundred percent, dude. Perfect example of a complete pig. That should that is the worst company in the world, but 
boom, 400%. Apple's never going to do that. No. And, and for anyone listening, this is on uh, October 21st that we're recording this one. So if you want to look at that chart. 2020. Yeah, yep. it, it's, yeah, 2020. You can, I mean, you're going to see inside the chart. I mean, if you think that the company didn't, didn't pump that bitch up just to drop an offering for their compensation. Dude, that's what these companies are. They're garb. They, if, if people would really like, understand what an offering is and and how they work and know what these companies are doing to shareholders it's fucking crazy that it's even legal that they could do this shit it's crazy one of, one of my favorite ways to understand the stocks that we're trading is on the wolf of wall street wherever he takes a job at like the shitty firm and he's calling the people he's like we have an aerodynamic company and it is yep. doing the craziest thing. And then it shows the picture of it out of the grandma's yeah, basement. That's a, dude, like that, those are the stocks. Those are, are the ones. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so, so I, I, I have two more questions and we can see if you guys any after this. Um, what, one's a real, I guess it's kind of open ended. What do you think you do differently from other traders? that's made you like this successful trader maybe it be your strategy or your risk management whatever that might be i think that what would that answer be i i think that i don't get greedy you know where if something if i'm in something and it's up 50 percent, 20 percent, 30 percent, depending on why and what's going on um i'll scale some out like why are you waiting for a 200% run? You know, I, I just, I've never understood that. Then the next thing is I do not bag hold. I don't do it. I never have, even when I was a, how, how many stocks do you hold overnight? Sorry. Uh, the most, I know like a lot of people think you're more of a day trader. So I'd like to, right. The most I've held overnight is like four stocks, man, my wife's home and the dogs are about to start barking. I think. But the, the most I've held overnight is like four stocks because uh, and that that's a lot for me. Like I don't I try not to hold too many with a if they're if they're swings and they're, you know, longer term stuff or like a week out. That's cool. But if I know it's just an overnight hold because of momentum. Yeah, that's like one, two t tops because it's too hard to manage those and I can't sleep. You know? OK. OK. And last question is, is there anything you have to say to the people who think that PDT is their line to success? Like if I hit PDT, I'll be successful. I feel like we see so many people that this like my goal is PDT by the end of the year. Why or why not should that 25K be that amount? Honestly, 25K is not the number. You need 30 to 35 because you need a cushion. If you get to 25 and you think that's game over for you, you're going to lose that money. It's going to come right back down. And uh, I, I know I did it a couple of times. And you really have to get a cushion. So you people think, oh, once I hit that 25,000, then I can scalp all these calls and scalp all these plays. And it sounds great. It mm -hmm. sounds, yeah, it sounds like that's the way to go, right? But you hit it. And then you start trying and it doesn't work because you're not that kind of trader because you've been conditioned to your three trades a week or your cash account. Right. So uh, the 25 is not the yeah, number. That, that was. That, yeah. It's, it's such a it, like if you're scalping on a cash account and you're like, oh, fuck, I'm done at one o'clock every day because I'm out of capital. I think those are the traders that are going to succeed with PDT as opposed to the ones that swung. To right. Get. And also, I mean, as much as I even hate to promote them, how I've gotten out of PDT more than once was you stock trade. <laughs> I mean, it sucks because you can't buy a lot of stocks under a dollar. You know, they fixed their limited liquidity issues where you couldn't buy low floats hardly at all. But that's when I got when I had my account pushed back to ten thousand. You know, that's what I did. I went back to fucking you stock trade, and uh, and I grew it. Until I hit, I think, I think when I hit 24 or 22, I, I transferred over and to a cash account and, uh, and I was, you know, just trading with the cash account with them doing like 10,000 a day. But, uh, you know, what sucks about that is when you do get over PDT, let's say you hit 30 from the 24 or 22,000, you've got to now convert the money to a, a margin account so you've got to wait a couple of days for everything to clear and i i didn't i didn't convert uh to a margin account until i hit the 30k 
And when I hit 30,000, literally Zach messaged me. He's like, what the fuck are you still doing on a cash account, man? Like transfer the money. And I was like, but it's going to take me like two days to transfer this money. And I want to trade the market's hot market's hot as fuck. He's like, dude, you're going to make so much more money if you just fucking transfer the money. So I did. And that was, uh, that was like that, that May 1st number is when I hit that 30,000 was May 1st of this year. And since then I've made 1.6 million. So. <laughs> Hell fucking, it seems like it worked out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. All right, man. Well, it, Hugh, do you have do you have anything before we uh, we let him go? No, I think I think you really. I, I love this personally. I think the one question is that a lot of traders think that like they'll hit a bottom, or that you know that we all hit one bottom, and then all of a sudden like everything was okay again. And <laughs> I think that um, one of the things I try and stress is that there's so many bottoms. Like there's I think so I've many. hit bottom. There's so like four times I think I hit bottom. Uh, even like, and I think the, uh, even a bigger thing is that, um, you know, what do you, what do you kind of do when you go like, do you ever go on like a cold streak, quote unquote, a cold streak, whether it be short term, long term? Yeah. And can you just so, touch on that? And, and that's the other big thing is knowing, knowing yourself and knowing when the market's going to get cold because. What, what my problem used to be was over trading and I would, I would get in and, and just stay here all day. Now, the, one of the, the things that has saved me and made me the most money is when I feel the market shifting, you'll see me disappear in the middle of the day. I literally leave the house and go get lunch somewhere, or go get breakfast and sit at a coffee shop for a while and just chill because that actually saves me and makes me money because I know if I was to stay, I'm going to lose money. Because, you know, every day around 10, you know, 11, whatever, 12, that's when the market shit slows down. So, you know, you take that break and then, but sometimes I'm rushing back because I'm like, oh, it's getting hot again. I need to be back, you know, but, but yeah, knowing, knowing when to walk away is so important, no matter if you're down or up, you know, uh, people just like, if you're up, people want to keep going. If they're down, they want to get it back. And that that's a huge issue and you like you have to um i do kind of a lot of talking to myself about staying in the same groove that i'm in and doing the same things that i'm doing because they're working for me so uh, if i get a little out of the groove i kind of tell myself hey go back you know if i'm getting down i tell myself hey go back in the middle have, have you uh this, this is kind of a personal question i'll make it the last one have you adjusted any of your strategy? I mean, you've been on such a hot streak where you've been on like 140 green days in a row. Has there, aside from like the obvious, every you were it was so easy to be green every day in like May and June. Was there a point where you had to really adjust your strategy come August and September? And how exactly did you do? Oh, that? for August, yeah. So when August came, um, you really like have to. Like I said, when I when I started trading and I was good in those shitty months, right? That's I I knew how to trade in those months. I uh, just carried but that when strategy. It, when on. the market got hot, yeah. So I transferred back to my yeah. old ways. So you actually had to alter, yeah. You had to alter your strategy for the running right. months and then just get revert back. Gotcha. Because for the months Pushed when everything's well. hot, you're buying things and you're holding them for a longer period of time. Mm-hmm. That's hard to do if you if you like to scalp this right game. in the dead months. You've got you can't make it if you do that. If you buy something and hold it and think it's going to keep going, you're wrong because it doesn't work out. I mean, look at August; like nothing was holding up, you know. And and just I mean, even even this past week, I mean, you'll you'll see it right now. It goes big green. It's super easy to even swing and scalp and all this stuff. And then short attack three days in a yeah. row, like you have it this week. It's yeah. So but, well. You you do have responsibilities. The woman's home. The dogs are barking, <laughs> and we have been so pleasured to have you on. Thank you so much for joining us. I PJ. love you guys. You're the best. Uh, we love you more. <laughs> All right, bro. All right, bro. All right, Later, see you, man. man. Thanks, bro. Okay, that was good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So today we're going over some of the tier one PR terms, basically the top terms to be looking for when you see news dropped and kind of go over some of their recent PRs and see how the stocks reacted. Yeah, I really like this because this is so important. Um, and there's a few things, you know, to always look for as far as press releases go. And it's kind of like 
when you start to really be inside this game, you know, you know stocks that move well. And then on top of that, when you know that a certain PR moves well on stocks and the stock moves well itself, I mean, it's like a match made in heaven. So, you know, when you're inside this game for a while and you start to learn, um, as we talked about a few episodes ago, the personality of stocks, you know, when sometimes you just trade, you know, a certain ticker really, really well. Um, and of course, you know, it's, it's not like, you know, you trade this ticker once and it's done. You know, when you start to trade a few tickers really well, and then on top of that, there's a few times a year where they'll come out with a really good PR and it's a match made in heaven. You trade the ticker well, and you already know that this is a good PR and it reads well, and you know about the PR and you know, the personality of the ticker, it's a match made in heaven. So you get, you know, one of those a month and it just is like the cherry on top. So I really like this segment. Yeah, man. Uh, like you said about PR teams, there's a lot to know about PR teams. Like you'll start to see a pattern in a lot of companies PR team that you can really benefit from if you can start to recognize or predict them. Is there anything like else you come on touch on regarding the PR teams themselves before kind of diving into some of these key terms? No, I just think that, you know, we, we talked about it on the, you know, I keep going back to this, but um, to the personality socks, that's because this ties right into not not just the personality episode, but I think on the fundamental yeah. analysis, there was a uh, good bit in season one. I think it's like episode five or seven or something. Uh, fundamental analysis and personality of the stock both have a lot about PR companies involved. Yeah, and this ties right into it. Um, and, and I think the really b- good thing is like it just comes down to, again, um, you know, putting pieces of the puzzle that work for you. Um, it's it's not a cut and dry Um, But if you put a little bit of everything together, a good PR team, and you start to learn, okay, they like to do um, Friday PR, Friday 8 a.m. PRs every third Friday of the quarter or whatever, you know, so I think that I think that when you start to learn some of that and you start to learn, you know, what PRs move and when you start to trade a bunch of tickers, you know, and you start to really find out, get your mojo. Sometimes I found that I trade a stock horribly, like horribly and i just don't know what it is like i'll sell and it's like it's like the thing was just waiting till i sold to go and then there's some tickers where it's like i could throw i could throw any amount of money at it and it just works out no matter what so i think that that this is going to tie in really well with those um previous episodes yeah. Okay. So uh, this list and uh, a lot of other PR information have been provided by the Scalp team in that list. So definitely go check them out. They have a lot more in-depth information on like how to take advantage of some of these. So I'll also post a tier list in the reply to the video. Uh, okay. So tier one terms are as follows. Endpoints, FDA, phase three, debt free, COVID, merger, and Trump. So I guess we can kind of start with phase three. And I know this this one might be more up your alley, but just to give an example, I know this one may hurt some people as it was pretty recent. But ONTX, uh, you see it's run from 50 cents to $1.30 at the end of July in just a matter of days. But uh, as we know, holding through phase three data is a little tough at some times. And at the end of August, that phase three data was released and it dropped 70% in one halt. So uh, could you kind of dive more into like why things run up after phase three and then why we should never hold through phase three? Yeah. So especially with small caps, um, I mean, ONTX's data, we all took a bath. It came out a month early and this was after the the company went on this pump job of um, telling us how great data is and showing us statistics about how if um, if phase two was this and that then there's no way that they fail phase three and this and that. And then a month before it's due, they drop it on our heads. So I consider phase three like kind of, you know, I've never run a marathon. I don't have any plans to. But when you get all the way through the marathon and there's like just a black hole 20 feet before the um, finish line. And if you jump over the black hole, you make it. And if not, but like 99% of people fall inside the black hole. So... You know, you run all the way through the marathon just to get sunk into the black hole. That's kind of how I think of phase three, because it takes years and years and tons of money to get through preclinical, to get through, um, you know, one and two, uh, adding, adding um, participants, um, you know, going. It's so much money. It's tens of millions of dollars for even the smallest 
um, clinical and it takes years. Sometimes some of these take, I mean, some oncologies phase threes can take years. Um, so phase three is definitely, if it, I always like to chase um, phase three. So what that means is like, if I feel really good about the phase three, then I, what we'll do is we'll play the run up. And then if I feel really, really good, I'll cut 75% of my position, hold the 25%. And then, um, and then if the good news comes out, then I'll chase the news because it, it, anybody that gets approved for a phase three, that's, that's like the cake. So that's kind of a little bit about phase three. It's, 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 it's at the very end of the pipeline. It's like, it's like the the light at the you can see the light at the end of the tunnel, but you have like a eight foot ogre to go through. And and obviously another one of the terms was FDA. Besides phase three, like what what kind of would be the difference? Obviously phase three is kind of falls into that range, but what what are the terms in like an FDA? Would you be looking for in a uh, in a PR, especially if you're just looking for and you're like, holy shit, this is good news. Yeah. So really, um, so it really it's really dependent on the drug, but. Um, there's a few things to know. One that, you know, kind of phase one is kind of, I consider it like, think about it. You know, if you start dating a girl and phase one is like the first date, you know, you, you, you know, you're kind of rubbing her back, but you, you're definitely not going lower than, you know, the mid range, the mid back. Um, then, you know, date two. Okay. So now, now you, now you get a little closer, but, um, but you're certainly, you're certainly not going, you know, yeah, you're not doing anything that uh that you know you're not doing anything that you wouldn't do in front of her father. Exactly, exactly. You know, you're giving her a high five. That's what you're doing <laughs> on phase two, and then phase three is where you bring her to the you know you walk her to the step and give her a little peck on the cheek. You know, um. So, so I honestly don't remember where I was going with this. <laughs> And then, then I, phase three, I, like I, right as she walks inside, she never talks to you again. And also she <laughs> signed into your bank account. Yeah, you come back the next day and uh, the apartment's cleared out. Um, yeah, so, so obviously the, the way we're explaining these are more from like a swing perspective. I know like a lot of people are wondering, and, and PJ kind of touched on in the interview, but... Uh, a lot, a lot of people, uh, especially when you're talking about like Zach and PJ and all of these people, like that just scalp for real quick. Uh, they'll they'll add these PRs right whenever they see it released if they notice that it's really good news, and then they already have this decent average because they're playing it at like three in the morning or five in the morning, and then they just add on dips throughout the day, and they have this comfortable position size and a comfortable average, and I think that's where a lot of, of these gains and quick recognition comes from. And, and the really important thing also to note is, um, is, is one that all of these have a substantial, uh, will have a dip at some point. Um, so I think a, where a lot of traders get caught is that they just like, Oh man, like, like phase three approved, uh, you know, say, say the average, you know, midpoint was like, um, you know, say, say the standardized to be successful, like 65% of the patients, had to get like a certain percentage or whatever. And this hit 85%. So that's a really good, that would be like a really good statistic. So a lot of people see that and then they see the phase three approved. So they're like, oh man, like this thing's going to the moon. Bye, 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 bye. And then there's a huge dip. And that's because, um, you know, again, supply and demand, supply and demand. And um, so if you're going to chase these things, you can totally chase these things because these are really good PRs. But always just get in on a dip yeah have have your risk management i know we always yeah, talk about a management. lot of times not having stop losses but these are ones where you need to be aware yeah and know your resistance and support and also like like you were talking about with all these such good news and bear fucker actually told me or i i read this is what he said uh, he said, remember, traders read PRs using fourth grade math most of the time. They don't want to figure yeah. out how much 300,000 employees under management will generate. They want $2 million order. And I think that's why you'll see a lot of new plays garner some more attention solely based on like the terminology they use in their yeah. PR headlines. Yeah, yeah, the headlines, everything. Um, if you guys follow Zach closely or um, really, really kind of read into his stuff, um, he's, he, he touches on it here and there. Um, he talks about, oh, the headline reads well, or that headline doesn't read well. So even if the PR is really good, um, you know, people, people don't 
really read it. I mean, we see 13G amendments um, that are actually a decrease in institutions, you know, in, 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 I mean, uh, a decrease in institutions, uh, institutional holding literally go up 20% because people are like, oh man, a fund just balled in. Yeah, we, we talked about it last week with, with yeah, we just, did. all it takes is one person saying the wrong thing yeah. and everyone just believes it. So, I mean... It really falls into the fact that <clears throat> people are investing in something they're not even reading. <laughs> so you exactly. never know what can happen. And then in the same thing, if you guys really start to, to you know, get a quick eye for these and read these, I mean, it's the same thing with like offerings. Offerings without warrants that tank underneath um, the, the offering price. I mean, that's an easy money. That's an easy scalp for 5 7%. You, you, you don't even have to mention it. Just read it. If it, it KTOV, we, I always go back to this one because it just it's ingrained inside my head. But when we had it at um, like 145 or something, it was like a $7 million offering, which is not a, not a lot. And the offer price was like 5% lower than the actual price. It was it, the, it was supposed to be at closing price to like two days before or whatever. So it was, um, the offering price was 132. The stock was sitting at like 140. It tanked to like 120. I, I, it, it, that's an e- no warrants, small offering. That's easy money right there. Scalp. Yeah. So, so it, like, like we talked about the one time we did the fundamental episode, like there's, there are those things that sometimes you have to open the, open it. Control F, find what you're looking for, and just know. Yeah. There, there are three more terms you need to go over. Uh, I think the next one we can kind of go over is debt free. And I and I know, is, is this something that's always going to come out in an earnings report, or how else is this going to come out in a PR? Yeah. So sometimes um, a company, especially a, well, especially a small cap, because, um, because on more mid caps, analysts will give breakdowns and they'll kind of say, okay, based on based on the last three quarters, they should be out of debt by now. So yeah, they're, they, they're they have more... they have people besides FinTwit to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, there's literally people paid so much money to just find out when they'll be out of debt. Um, but so for small caps, you know, usually they'll get, because small caps, you know, you know, it, every small cap is considered like the pipe dream and like the next Amazon, blah, blah, blah. And one of those steps is getting debt free. So a lot of them will usually give a separate PR. They sometimes they'll give a PR with their earnings report, even though it's in the earnings report. And that's just so that like the headline comes up. We are debt free again, because traders don't know how to read, you know, so they'll give a separate PR, a press release saying that we're debt free. But that's not really going to affect I mean, that, that's kind of like a quick pop and like fluff PR that wouldn't it mm-hmm. be. Yeah. Yeah. For the longevity of the company, it's really good. But in terms of um, chasing the catalyst up, it's not really great because most of the time, if they're becoming debt free, then it probably then they were probably pretty close to debt free the quarter before. But but if they had large amounts of debt and then all of a sudden they're debt free. So the headline reads something like ABCD just announced debt that they will be debt free by the end of the year. Um, previously 80 million in debt and like their market cap is like 200 million. So that would be huge. Yeah. It'd be, it'd be like, uh, it'd be like Dan Bilzerian's company ignite, even though everyone thinks they're $60 million in debt. If they had a PR come out that said yeah. debt free, I mean, that'd be oh, massive. exactly. That would be <laughs> ridiculous. That would be absolutely ridiculous, especially because their market cap is so small. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then also that leads into, okay, how did they do that? They probably had a big delivery. Okay. Well, if they didn't announce that they had a big delivery, then it's on its way. And there's so many, there's so, that's a great PR if they all of a sudden just turn it around. But that being said, most of the time it's just, you know, it's kind of boring and it's like, okay, they have $3 million in debt left, you know, in quarter two, Quarter three, they had 1.5. So now you can expect by quarter four, they'll be out of debt. Okay, well, we got two more, uh, merger and coronavirus. I think coronavirus, um, so this one's pretty straightforward. If you just had your eyes open the past few months while trading stocks, you'd know if you put coronavirus in a PR, it's going to go bananas. Uh, if you yeah. want to just take a more recent one and just prove how crazy it can be, uh, Kodak, the co- the camera company, a couple months ago, got news that it would receive a seven hundred and sixty five million dollar loan from the U S government to produce COVID related pharmaceutical co- uh, components, <laughs> and it ran two hundred percent. So I, I mean that that one's just I think it's just like that buzzword that it that you need right now. It's like the Warren Buffett, yeah. the coronavirus. Yeah. 
And part of that is because, and this is another thing, guys, why headlines are so important, is because there's algorithms um, that chase news that have certain um, PRs and, and certain times, stuff like that. So if anything says approved um, phase three or approved phase two or um, you know something along that lines or coronavirus for sure, um, then it's then an algorithm's probably going to chase it as well, which obviously helps the stock run. Yeah. Uh, okay. So the last one is merger. Uh, obviously, the more recent one is SPAC. But if you want to see one that was great, great success, uh, SHLL after it announced its merger date for September the twenty eighth, uh, it saw run from fifteen dollars to fifty dollars over the course of I think two three months. Uh, <laughs> so. You know, after the mergers, you never know what's going to happen. But, you know, usually, how more often than not do you, do you see, like, a run-up to the merger? Uh, was this back really kind of an anomaly, or, or what can you kind of talk on that? Uh, yeah, no, mergers are great because usually you can get a pretty good idea of what the merger is. Or, or what the merger is going to be worth, which hence you can figure out what the company is going to be bought for. So if it's a hundred, so if it's being bought for, and usually if you're if if a company is being bought out, it's being bought out at a premium. So if you know that um that their market cap's a hundred million and they're being caught, I mean, and they're being bought for a hundred and twenty million, or they're merging and the the mergers for 120 million on well for their side then that then that means that your shares at the very minimum are worth 20% higher so if it's trading at $10 that means that you're at least going to get 12 um and then then sometimes i mean then after that then fomo just kicks in and like the the i mean dss i remember dss um you know i mean that thing ran wild on when it, when it when they found out that the merger was approved like when the merger was going to be was going to make dss worth double i think it ran three times uh, I mean, you know, three times higher. So it's really, it, it can be a really good catalyst because it's solid. You can find out exactly what your shares are going to be worth. Um, so at the very minimum, if you just hold them, that's what they're going to be worth. So it's an easy trade. And then sometimes FOMO just kicks in and it goes so much higher. All right. I think that uh, clears it up for this episode. I think the only one we really didn't touch on was uh, Trump and endpoints. And uh, we'll, we'll try and get to those later. We d There are a few other tiers we'll get to. But thank you guys all for joining us. We hope you enjoyed the PJ Matlock interview. Make sure to like, subscribe on the YouTubes, and five-star rates us, and subscribe on everything else. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and we will see you next week.